open her up here if you want to claim them for yourself and take them home to use at home. You're welcome to it. They don't accomplish a whole lot just sitting there. All right, so I know it's been a couple of weeks since we met. Um, let's start with a short review. Um, <clears throat> the Sermon on the Mount. To whom is Jesus talking? So what's our audience? His disciples. Okay, so the disciples are there. Who else? Crowd, okay. There's one other group of people that's here. Okay. Um, so that's our audience. All right. Uh, what is Jesus? Is what is Jesus um, doing as he's going through the Sermon on the Mount? Like, what is he? What things is he looking at? What is his what is his focus right now? What is he trying to explicate? Maybe we'll give the wrong answer. <laughs> well, give me an answer. What is he trying to explicate? An answer, and you'll answer. Okay. Uh, explain, explaining uh, behavior. Go ahead. Oh, right. Not, not the, yeah. Okay, so what Jesus is doing is he's explicating, he is not intensifying. Okay? The law. So when we look at the law, we think, we can tend to think, and this has been taught a lot of, in a lot of different settings, that he is intensifying the law. Right? He's saying... Um, if you're angry, we're looking, we're looking, we're starting with anger today. If you're angry at your brother, <clears throat> right, you've already committed murder in your heart. We look at that in our mind as an intensification of do not murder, right, which is a, which is a law, one of the Ten Commandments. Jesus is not intensifying that. He's not, say, he's not trying to take it a step further. Instead, what he is doing is he's explicating what the law has always taught, which is that it all is about the heart. So anger is born out in murder, right? So if we think about Cain and Abel, why did Cain murder Abel? Because he was, well, jealousy, anger, because Abel's sacrifice was accepted and his was not. So he's explicating the, the, the fact uh, he, uh, that, that it's a heart issue and that the law is seeking to get at the inside of a person, their internal world. And so he's not, he's not trying to make it harder. He's showing the real thrust. That's explication versus intensification. Explication means... You're getting down to the finest details of a matter to, so as to fully understand it, okay? So it's a little different than explanation. You can explain something without getting into the minutia of the thing. Does that make sense? So explication is another step beyond explanation. All right. So with those things in mind, we're going to be talking today starting with anger versus murder. Or rather, anger and murder. So we've got that blocked off here. All right. So anger and murder is our first subject today. 
So let's look at this. This is going to be Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 21 and going through verse 26. You have heard it said to an older generation, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subjected to judgment, and whoever insults a brother will be brought before the council, and whoever says you, you fool will be sent to a fiery hell. So then, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come present your gift. Reach an agreement quickly with your accuser uh, while on the way to the court, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge hand you both, or the judge hand you over to the warden, and you will be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. All right. Anger and murder. So let's take a look at this. Um, starting in verse 21, we see this, this, this phrase. Uh, you said it to an older generation. You might have, you have heard it. Uh, the ancients were told, um, you shall not murder. So um, I want to draw your attention to this because uh, there's quite a debate over this. In Hebrew, just like in English, oops, Murder. Murder and kill. Just like in English, in Hebrew, they are two different words. So in some instances, uh, I think the KJV translated, thou shalt not kill, right? That's, just, that's a bad translation. Thou shalt not murder, right, is, is correct. This is the word that the Ten Commandments use, not this word. Um, in, in, uh, in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to kill and there's a time to let live, right? That uses this word, all right, in the Hebrew. To say thou shalt not kill and use it as a, as a means to excuse, say, soldiers going into battle or whatever, that seems kind of um, um, opposite, right? So, you know, God orders Israel to go in and, and take the land. Right, which involves killing people. Well, if the command is thou shalt not kill, then he's commanding them to break the commandment, right? As opposed to thou shalt not murder, which is the real word that's being used there. All right. So, the ancients. This could be understood as to the ancients or by the ancients. Now, the first part of this verse is from the Ten Commandments. Right, That should be pretty, pretty evident to us uh, if you've been around the Bible for any length of time. Uh, but the second part is harder to identify, and maybe a quote from one of the rabbinical schools, uh, Shammai the conservative or Hillel the liberal. Um, this implied a rejection of the Pharisaical scribal interpretation, while at the same time asserting the inspiration of the OT, all right, of the Old Testament. So he's saying, "This is scripture. Thou shalt not murder. Do not murder. This is tradition, or you'll be handed over for judgment." Right. So he's, he's separating those two things out. Okay? Murder. Uh, this is a quote from the Septuagint, or the LXX, uh, Exodus 20.13, or Deuteronomy 5.12. It is a future active imperative, or indicative, used as an imperative. And then I was right, yeah, the KJV has kill, but this rendering is too broad in scope. Scope. Um, the NKJV and a lot of the newer modern translations have the right word, which is murder. A more accurate translation would be non-legal premeditated murder. All right. Say that one again. So a better trans, a more accurate translation of what we have in murder, as far as the Hebrew goes, is non-legal premeditated murder. In the Old Testament, and the reason I say it's non-legal is because in the Old Testament there was a legal premeditated murder called the blood avenger. All right? And you find that in Deuteronomy 19 and Numbers 35. You find it in Joshua 20. This was an exception that was made um, for somebody to, to be that blood avenger. And if you look at Deuteronomy 19, which we'll look at real quick, we'll find this in there. And... Uh,
All right, so this is going to be a rather lengthy section, but you'll see you'll see why it's important that we have this background as an understanding. Deuteronomy 19, starting in verse 1. When the Lord your God destroys the nations whose land He is about to give you and disposes them and settles and settle in their cities and houses, you must set apart yourself three cities in the middle of your land that the Lord your God is giving to you as a possession. You shall build a roadway and divide into thirds the whole extent of your land that the Lord your God is providing you as your inheritance. Anyone who kills another person should flee to one of these closest cities. Now this is a law pertaining to the one who flees in order to live. If he, was, if, he accident, if he has accidentally killed another without hating him at the time of the accident, suppose he goes with someone to the forest to cut wood and he raises his axe to cut a tree and the head flies loose from the handle and strikes his fellow workers so that he dies. The person responsible may then flee to one of these cities to save himself. Otherwise, the blood avenger will chase after him and kill him in the heat of his anger and eventually overtake and kill him, though this is not a capital case since he did not hate him at the time of the accident. Therefore, I am commanding you to set apart yourself three cities. If the Lord your God enlarges your border as he has promised and gives you uh, all the land pledged to them, then be careful to observe all these commandments that I'm giving you. So, um, in other words, this is manslaughter. So if there's an accident that happens, right, <clears throat> and uh, a man, somebody's killed, the, the person who did the who was the responsible party, so to speak, can flee to one of these cities of refuge, is what they were called. Hide there, get a fair trial, and you, the blood avenger for the family of the wronged individual could not go into the city and kill him. But that was a thing that was allowed for. Okay? And again, we see this in Deuteronomy 20. Uh... Or Deuteronomy 19, rather, Numbers 35 is another place where it's mentioned, and Joshua 20 is another place that it's mentioned. Uh, we, I don't know that we have uh, uh, an instance recorded in the Bible where it happened. Um, well, again, it was one of those things that was set up as, a, as, a, as an in-case. So God is, God is giving them... Um, yeah, so the cities of refuge here is then kind of further explained uh, in Numbers 35. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them when you cross over to the Jordan in the land of Canaan, you must designate some towns as towns of refuge for you, to which a person who has killed someone unintentionally may flee. And there they must stand as your towns of refuge for the, from the avenger in order that the killer may not die until he is to travel for the community. These towns that you shall give shall be six towns for refuge. You must give three towns on this side of the Jordan, and you must give three towns in the land of Canaan. So again, the blood avenger is one of those things where it was legal, premeditated murder. Um, and, and that was something that, that should be noted. Okay. Um, so... Uh, let me see here. I've got more notes on the Blood Avenger because it's an interesting topic. Yeah, so the Blood Avenger, um, this is a Hebrew term from, uh, which denoted a near relative who rendered aid to the family and avenged the family in the case of death or injury to a family member. This concept first appears in Genesis 4.14 and 9, 5, and 6. So, there you go. Not to that extent, no. Not to that extent. No. Okay. <laughs> so Deuteronomy, what chapter is that on? Uh, so uh, if you want, uh, yes, it's Deuteronomy. It's mentioned in Deuteronomy 19, Numbers 35, and then I believe in Joshua. I don't remember if he's re-giving the command or if it's an example of the command being carried out. Let's look at Joshua 20 real quick. Okay, yeah. So he's just he's giving again the 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 necessity for these cities of refuge for those who have unintentionally killed someone. So that's what he's doing in, in, in Joshua twenty. Um, 
they had gone from a nomadic people to a more of a settled people, yeah. that they were, um, you know, they were basically had to overcome a lot of life history to get used to living in one place. And yep. It was a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so then Jesus, in, in quoting the Old Testament and the, Levitic, or the, the rabbinical teaching on that passage, Jesus says um, this, But I say to you, in teaching something radically different from the rabbis of his day, whose authority was founded in quoting previous Jewish teachers as their authority, Jesus, an authority unto himself, um, uh, as a true revealer of the meaning of the Old Testament, um, says, I myself and no other. Um, and he says, everyone who is angry. Uh, this is a present middle participle. Uh, this was a Greek term used for a settled, nurtured, non -for uh, matured, non-forgiving, long-term anger. Um, this person continued to be intensely angry. So it's somebody who's constantly, it's a mature kind of anger. Um, have you ever known somebody who had that kind of mature overwhelming anger. That's kind of what Jesus is getting at here. Um, with his brother. Um, the King James Version adds without cause. Um, this is a Greek manuscript variation. Uh, the, addition in the, or the addition is not in the early Greek manuscripts or the Vulgate. However, there is one that, um, that has them, or there are several that have them in there. Um, but most of the, uh, most of the older and better documents have a shorter reading. Um, so it's that, that intense anger, but it's not without, it doesn't say that it's without cause. Okay. Anger always has a cause and we know this, right? It's usually some sort of offense. So you can't really be angry without a cause. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. All right. Right, but it's because they feel the the cause is they feel like the world is against them, right? So, you can't, like I said, it, it's hard to be angry without a cause. Um, you fool. Now this is kind of an interesting one. Okay, so you fool. You, you see that there, raka. Some of your translations might have raka, um, which is a term for an empty-headed person incapable of life. <laughs> This section is not dealing with specific titles. Uh, one cannot call, one can or cannot call another person, but it's supposed to deal with a believer's attitude toward others, especially their brothers. Um, the Greek term here is moros, which is fool, uh, which is uh, where we get the word moron from. Um, it's also found in the word sophomore. So sophomore is Greek. Sophis is wisdom. Moron is idiot or fool. So a sophomore is a sophisticated idiot. There you Don't go. Don't tell my great granddaughter that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, that's, that's, your, that's, your, <laughs> that's your Greek lesson for the morning. Anyway, moros is translated as fool. It's meant to reflect that Aramaic term. Um, however, Jesus' wordplay was not to the Greek word moros, but primarily to the Hebrew word more, which means a rebel against God. Um, you can see F.F. F. Bruce answers that question rather rather handily. I love F.F. F. Bruce. If you're looking for a good commentator, F.F. F. Bruce is definitely one of those. <coughs> Jesus called the Pharisees by this very term in Matthew 23, 17. Um, not only our actions, but our motives, our attitudes, Determine sin against our fellow man. Murder, as far as God is concerned, can be a thought, right? Because it begins, um, Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Other Old Testament writers how, talk about how out of our heart we act, right? So, you know, that, that anger will come out. Um, so, hatred of our brother and sister clearly shows that we do not go, know God, uh, socially speaking, a hateful thought is better than a death, but remember this section of Scripture is meant to shatter all of that self-righteous pride 
uh, in one's own goodness. Uh, it is possible that this threefold expression was a sarcastic play on scribal interpretation methods. So Jesus is kind of playing with, with the scribes and the Pharisees here by doing a triple, kind of a triple word play. Okay? Showing them just how smart he is and how not smart they are, or how much of a moron they are, right? Uh-huh. But he was he was required because he played their game. And so he forced them into following him all the way through. Yeah. Because it was noted, you know, and, and um, they were they were without excuse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well and that's the thing, is like Jesus that's why Jesus we have to remember Jesus was a Pharisee. Mm-hmm. So he knew how to play their word games. And often we're like, Oh, Jesus is is you know, because Jesus is pure as the white driven snow. He can't be sarcastic. He can't, you know, uh, be snarky. Uh, he can't be rude or loud or anything like that. And really, when you look at some of the things that Jesus says about the Pharisees, we noted that he calls them a fool in Matthew 23. He calls them a, a, a brood of vipers. That's not something you can do nicely, right? <laughs> he calls them whitewashed tombs, you know, all pretty on the outside, but decay and full of rot on the inside. Again, that's not something you can say nicely. We know that he took a cord of rope and cleared out the temple, not once, but twice. Uh, it said he was angry, but he didn't sin, right? <laughs> so these are things you can't do if you're, you know, that, that classic vision that we have of Jesus as this guy who uh, never raised his voice or never got snarky or never got sarcastic or anything like that because Jesus, he did. Um, he had normal human emotions, but he didn't allow those normal human emotions to drive him towards sin. Okay? Um, so, yeah, when he's saying stuff like this, when he's talking, when he's like doing this triple kind of entendre stuff, um, he's doing it tongue in cheek. He's doing it with a snarky undertone there. To show them that, hey, I can play this game too, you know. Um, the Supreme Court, uh, he mentions the, the council, the Sanhedrin, the local synagogue court. Really, I think if we look at what Jesus is talking about, the local synagogue court makes the most sense when he's talking about this. Because if you're out in Damascus, you're not going to drive or pull someone all the way to Jerusalem to stand trial before the Sanhedrin unless it's something really egregious you're more than likely going to take it to your local synagogue council and have the elders there judge the issue. Okay. Uh, Fiery hell. Uh, This is the Greek contraction of Gehenna. So if you remember, we've talked about how Gehenna is not Hades, which is Sheol. (laughs) Right? We've talked about that. So... This is more like a fire language, okay? So we have to keep this little equation in mind when we're thinking of what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about Lake of Fire, Gehenna, (coughs) not Hades, Sheol, okay? He's not talking about those two things. Um, Everybody remember the difference between those two? Those four concepts. Lake of Fire, Gehenna is hell. Hades, Sheol is the temporary resting place of the dead. On the other side. Yeah. So Revelation tells us that both death and Hades will be thrown into the Lake of Fire, which means that they're temporary constructs. Does that make sense? So... We can't, so like there are times when hell is translated, but it's really Hades. Um, And so we got to be careful when we're looking at that. But Hades is kind of the, when Jesus goes down into the pit and spends three days in the grave, he's not here. He's here. Because it talks about how he goes down and brags to the spirit in bondage. 
and how he pulls out the righteous dead on his coattails when he leaves. Um, that he goes down to here. Not here. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the lake of fire. Gehenna was a was a trash dump. It's called the field of Hinnom is what it's it's called in in uh, you might see that in other places. It was a trash dump outside the city that caught fire and was constantly burning because people were throwing fuel into it. Um and so um this the, these two are very closely related. When that side was taken out and emptied, they would have watched that. Yep. So and this this wow. is wow. It's like, oh, they're leaving. So anything that was good to look at, at least you know, beautiful and vegetation and all, and now it's empty. And yep. they're left more alone than ever. So when Jesus says to the thief, "Today you'll be with me in paradise," and the in the Greek and Roman conception of Hades, paradise was on one side, and you had the pit, um, or even what's called Tartarus. Uh, um, Paul or Peter uses that word as kind of the place of deep darkness for this side. Gehenna is Greek? Gehenna is Hebrew. Hebrew. Yeah, it's, it's the Valley of Hinnom. Yes. So Jesus is talking about the fiery pit that, that will be thrown into. That's hell. He's actually talking about hell there. Um, uh, so there's a couple of different, um, if you want to look at a couple of different views on hell, okay? Um, there are a couple of good YouTube videos that you might take a look at that kind of compare and contrast the different views on hell, which is like a fire. There's one by, um, there's one called the fire consumes. Actually, what is it called? The fire that consumes. And that's by a guy named Edward Fudge. So he and he's more of a conditional immortality kind of guy. So if you want to know about that position, he talks about what hell means from that perspective. And then Steve Gregg does a really good one called The Three Views of Hell. And you can type those into your YouTube search bar and pull those up. By Steve Gregg? Yeah. Fabulous book. Yep. To get a, a picture of those whose viewpoint is annihilation, that eventually yes. the uh, unsaved will be annihilated versus uh, the people that know um, punishment is, uh, it goes on forever with the awareness of the yep. people. So the three views that he talks about are kind of the three views that are uh, held today. Yeah. So universalism is one of those views that's meh. You don't really find it in the early church at all. You don't really find it in, in even uh, uh, kind of the, the Roman Catholic tradition or the Reformed tradition. You do find these two, though, which is eternal conscious torment and conditional immortality. So... Um, but yeah, Steve Gregg will go through all three of these books, or all three of those. Um, there's a book, too, called The Three Views of Hell. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, um, they'll, go, they'll go through that. And Steve Gregg is really good. Yeah, so just the, the Three Views of Hell by Steve Gregg. You put it in YouTube, and there'll be a video that'll pop up. Um,
Uh -huh. And so all of this is about God allowing for free will. If, uh, as the starting of eternity and the miserableness of the people that are consigned to the fire, if they free will to be uh, taken out of existence, would God just honor that and take them out of existence? Well, Which okay, so yeah. Not existing. So the, the, so the problem I would have with that is that your free will choices have consequences. So at some point, you're going to suffer the consequences for your free will choices. So if the consequence after the judgment is either the fire, no amount of, or the eternal flame, no matter how much you will to just be destroyed, that's not the judgment, right? But part of the judgment could be also that you miss out on God. Well, yeah, you I mean... So I think it was, uh, it might have been C.S. Lewis who said that um, you have God's love over here and the absence of that love, it's not, it's not a quality that God has, but rather it's an absence of love, is this wrath over here. So you've got, uh, you know, you've got God's love and, and faithfulness shining towards those who believe. And then you've got God's wrath consuming those, whether it's consuming those in ECT, the ECT conception of hell or the CI conception of hell. God consuming those who reject him in his wrath, which is the absence of his love. Right? So uh, C.S. Lewis, I think, is the one who kind of drew that distinction. You have to take that into account. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, if you haven't read any C.S. Lewis, please do. He's fantastic. Um, but anyway, so what Steve Gregg will do is th there are some cases to be made that you can find universalism in the early church fathers, but what Steve Gregg will do is he'll go through all the evidences for all the people who believed in these various positions in the early church fathers. And you might be thinking, well, why are they important? Well, a lot of those guys like Polycarp was a disciple of John himself. So Polycarp was trained by the apostle John. So if Polycarp writes about things, it might be good to know, not that it's inspired scripture, but it might be good to know what Polycarp said about certain topics because Polycarp would have been taught directly from John. Um, and then you have others, other early church fathers who were also the students of the disciples. So you might, now that doesn't mean necessarily they, everything they wrote is gospel truth, you know, because we all get off in our theology, but... It's good to know what they thought about certain things to see how those ideas evolved over time. Um, so that's why there is value in the early church fathers, because we can see what they thought. Uh, Irenaeus is another one of those really good ones who talks about, um, I think, was Irenaeus, I don't remember if Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp or not. But he, but he was, was the one who, like, like Paul, Paul and, John and John, really struggled against Gnosticism. right? And by the time Irenaeus comes around, Irenaeus is full-fledged uh, in, he wrote this book called Against Heresies, which was a full-fledged condemnation of uh, fully matured Gnosticism, right? Um, anyway. Um, so yeah, so if you're going to be taken before the judge, and then um, what, 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 what Jesus goes on to say is, if you are in the process of bringing in an offering if you're in the process of coming before the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you do not continue in that act of worship okay it's necessary for you to go and be reconciled to your brother so that the act of worship you're doing is a pure one okay make peace with him quickly before he takes you to the local court um, so that way you two can be reconciled Right, that's that's Jesus's big, um, big encouragement, because it was very common in the ancient world for people to sue each other <laughs> over various things. So that's why when Jesus says, "If somebody sues you for your cloak, give to him your tunic also," you know, if if he forces you to go one mile, go with him too. <coughs> so um, 
Yeah. But Jesus is kind of taking the Tanakh and he's saying, here's, here's the practical application. Right? Anyway, any other questions about this section? No, this this is the final this is the final destination okay. for all of those who are in unbe- unbelief. Our final destination as believers is where? Heaven. Nope. The new, the new earth is our destination. Yeah. So when we we get a new earth to, you know, work on and do what Adam and Eve were supposed to do in the first place, you know? What's a little bit frustrating is there's so little of the earth right now, this present earth, which is much water, that even has sea going in, that if God's going to make another earth the same size, he'll probably want to fill it with a billion, billion people to fill up the earth. So we have to wait a long time until all those billion, billion people become his. No, I mean, not necessarily. (laughs) We don't know what the new earth is going to be like. So, um, I like C.S. Lewis. Maybe not crowded at all. Maybe ten miles of our own space. I mean, maybe, but yeah, the uh, the new earth, I think, is going to be a lot like the way C.S. Lewis describes it in the last battle, which is the culmination of the Chronicles of Narnia series, right? Mm -hmm. Um, C.S. Lewis. There's character, the, you know, at the end, they have the big battle. Uh, Narnia has its Armageddon. And all these people go to heaven. And the lion keeps shouting further up and further in. So as they're discovering new places, as they're discovering new things, further up and further in, further up and further in. And they keep discovering more and more yeah. until finally, the very last scene, the lion transforms into Jesus Christ and is talking to the kids who have died on it as a result. I'm sorry if you don't know this, but it's been out for 60 years. So if you haven't read it by this point, shame on you. Um, we have a but, but all the kids are the, all the kids have died in a train accident in London. Oh, I didn't know that part. Of it. <coughs> so all the kids who are part of that last battle have died in a train accident. And so Aslan saves them as they're going through this train accident, transports them to Narnia to fight in the last battle, and then they go on to heaven. So yeah, if you haven't read the last battle, sorry, but that's that's how that is. All right. okay. Anyway, that's all I have for you this morning. We'll start with adultery next week, which should be the fun one. Um, have you guys ever heard of the Adulterer's Bible? 